So uh, that's me in the bearded era. I, you know, I, my wife got sick of it, and so that had to go. Uh, and uh, my name is Ted Wang. I'm a partner at a venture capital firm called Cowboy Ventures. Um, I'm best known as uh, Aileen Lee's partner. Uh, so my, my partner is this, like, it, so I'm kind of like the sales ops person for our venture firm because like, my partner is like super glamorous and is on like magazine covers and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of like the operational person. I kind of make things happen and invest in companies that do back end stuff. You know, she does like ovens and, and you know, consumer goods and I do like stuff that should be on Excel or you know, that type of work and accounting software. So, you know, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a great partnership and uh, it's super, and super interesting to, uh, to get a, be, a, be a part of this company. Um, and, you know, I think the point of view that, that I'm going to express here is really from the investor point of view, right? And so I'm just going to tell one little story and then we'll, we'll go and, and dig deeper on it because from the investor point of view, you know, I, I spent uh, about uh, uh, 600 hours a year going to board meetings. So I, I like to count things. So 600 hours a year I'm in these meetings. And so I see this pattern like repeat itself time after time. And the pattern is as follows. A new salesperson comes in and, uh, and you know, a new VP of sales and uh, you know, she or he, you know, it's almost always he unfortunately, we're working to change that. But she or he comes in and, and, uh, and is like, oh, okay, everything was messed up before. I'm here, I'm gonna save the day. So everyone's like, great, this is gonna be awesome. We hired this great person, you know, she or he's gonna save the day. And so, you know, the first quarter, of course, they miss because that was that other person's fault and we're gonna blame that, the, the last person. And then they make like a quarter or two in a row. So now that person's a hero and we have a little parade and we say, ah, we're all so smart. And all those board members and the executives are so smart for hiring this person. And then they stumble for a quarter and then I'm just like, wait a second. Like, what's, what's going on here? And then they whiff big time on the next quarter, and then they get fired. So that's, you know, it, and that's, the, that's the, a pattern that we see time and time again. And so the average tenure of a, a VP of sales is 24 months. And so, like, why is that? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And, um, and a part of it, of course, is that, uh, you know, the VP of sales is kind of like the head coach in football. So if something goes wrong, you fire the head coach. And it doesn't matter if you have a bunch of bad players. And, and so a lot of times the product is wrong or the marketing's terrible or whatever and the VP sales is just, you know, right there. And I don't think that problem is solvable in the near term. Um, but I think there are a bunch of other problems that are solvable and, and that's what we want to talk about today. So investors perspective, like how do we think about uh, different stages of the company? I think the very beginning, the early phase, the seed round is, is there a market for this product? You know, if, if, would someone actually like buy this thing that people are talking about? And I think you know, the, the negative case is of course, no, nah, there isn't. You know, the, the, yeah, we, we talked to a bunch of people, they weren't interested, we couldn't sell it. Yeah, we could sell it, but maybe six people would buy it. And so there are all sorts of negative cases uh, about that. Uh, I think the more interesting phase, and I think where sales and sales ops people start to come in, is really getting to Series A. And so the real question is, we say is, is there product market fit? Um, and the failure case is that this, there's a sale, you can make a couple sales, but you know, the, there were early sales, but those sales aren't repeatable. And why would that be the case, right? Well, you need to have a working sales process, right? The sales, the process of selling has to be defined and has to work. Um, you need to have customers that actually pay for it, right? And so, you know, are these, or do you have that? Are customers paying? Uh, is there ROI? So when we talk to customers about whether or not uh, they're getting a positive return on the product, you know, do they say great things or do they say terrible things? Uh, believe it or not, I actually had a reference call once where I, I, was, I was calling on a potential investment and I said, you know, how much would you pay for this product? You know, and if we, if we took it away, <laughs> they said nothing. <laughs> so uh, it was a little strange. So obviously not an investment that we made. Uh, and then, you know, um, can we start to see that, that there's sales performance, right? Like, this isn't a point where, you know, you have a really predictable steady ramp and all, all of those types of different things, but are, are the basic elements in place? Um, and then you move to this next phase, the, the Series B rounds and the growth, and it's really all about growth and repeatable sales processes, right? So that there's, a, there's basically a, what I'd consider a growth foundation, right? Which is, you've got a sales, te sales team, you can ramp people and you can start to look and say, look, you know, we hired Joe on this day and you know, three months later he's starting to make his first sales and six months he's gonna be fully ramped and then Julie came in and it's in and around the same period of time and it starts to look more like a machine where the results are gonna be more predictable 
and less you know, haphazard. Uh, and then you, then you start getting all the other elements, the support team in place, and, and then these conversion metrics, right? So we sort of know if something's in the pipeline, we kind of have a sense of whether it's going to close or not. And, and these are the different uh, the stages that, uh, the different ways that investors at least think about uh, different stages. And this is what happens when they get stuck, right? Uh, so early phase is obvious, right? No one wants it. We can't sell it. Not interesting. Series A phase, it's really we can't build a sales process that's repeatable. Like we got one company in, in the financial sector and one company that sells meat and cheese, you know, and one, you know, it's all these different things. You kind of look at it and the investors, the Series A investors will look at it and they'll say, yeah, that doesn't really add up to anything great. And then, but once you get past that milestone, now you're like, you know, did they manage their growth? Did, did, you know, they found a product, they, they found a market, they found a product that fit that market, and then the real ultimate question is, did they manage their growth? Did they execute on their growth plans? And, and really, this comes down to sales execution, right? And, and this is kind of the saga that I was talking about before, and here's a, a different version of it, right, which is sales VP comes in, and you know, what's the first thing that she does? sets the sales plan, right? And so, and then it says, well, you know, I, I, I got, you know, I just started, so I put a plan together, and this is my best guess, but we'll, we'll work it all out, you know, eventually. And then, you know, a couple months go by, and like, well, it's not exactly right, and I didn't have all the information, and so I'm kind of working on it, and then, you know, and, and then the thing starts to, to tick, but then there's some, there's some problem underneath, and it's really usually a data problem. It's like, yeah, we, the sales are starting to flow, and I'm kind of making it, but there's something wrong with the data, and that was a great use of, had some great examples of, of that, and, and, you know, but that's okay, because you know what we'll do is we'll buy new data, and we'll get some different data sources, and that's going to solve all our problems, and, you know, and just, if I could just have some better data, and then it's like, well, okay, I got better data, but now that I have the data, I realize, like, our sales, we're all org organized the wrong way, so we'll reorg the team, right, and then that doesn't work, and then the person gets fired. So this is a, a, a pretty common saga that we see, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons I've, I'm so excited about trying to make, you know, make this uh, go away. Something's wrong, right? And so something's broken, and, and so what, what are we going to do about it? And I think one of the core elements is really, even at the very beginning stage, and that's where we tend to come in, I and mean, we invest at the earliest uh, stages for the company, is like, you got to start planning for eventual success uh, and really begin to lay the foundation early on in a company's life. And so, so we have these two different companies. Uh, I creatively call them company A and company B. Um, and I'm doing the, comp but it, the point here is to compare and contrast two different ways of, of approaching it. And you can see company A you know, gets this product, gets their first couple sales, defines an ideal customer profile, the, the ICP, and then, and then hire salespeople. What company B does three of those four things, um, but uh, doesn't define the ICP. And, um, and, and that is, that's sort of, it's like building a, a castle on an unstable foundation, right? Where, unless you know exactly who you're going after, you're just eventually going to run into trouble. So what's, what happens later, right? As the, um, and by the way, uh, I don't know, Darmesh uh, signed up for all of these numbers that, that's on, on the board. So just, I just want for all you guys to know, uh, I didn't, I, it's part of, the, part of the package here. But, um, so what, what happens with the good companies? Well, they build a good sales process, they get some customers, they start to repeat their sales, and now they're ready to ramp. And what happens to the naughty company B? Well, they don't build a sales process, right? So they have some customers, and those customers are basically one by you know, going out and finding, you know, and really through hustle, and, 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 you know, you, and you can fake it for a while, right? We, you can get, make a lot of calls, a lot of activity, and that can drive you to you know, a pretty decent sized uh, book of business, but eventually you're really gonna fall flat. And so you know, in, when you move on to that next phase of growth, um, you, know, you have to have a sales ops team, you look at company A, sales ops team, ramping that team, measuring their process, and of course the result is going to be they're, they're going to be growing quickly, whereas in company B, you know, have effectively none of those things, and, uh, and the results are going to be negative. So I've tried to think about this in terms of like, well, 
from a, a sales uh, leader perspective, what are the actual problems and, and how do we solve them, right? And so I, I kind of thought of four different problems. Uh, the first is in the planning process, right? If planning is broken, it kind of doesn't really matter. It, you know, if, if your plan isn't good, then you're, 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 you're not going to have a successful ability to execute. Then the second problem is poor execution, right? You've got a decent plan, but it somehow breaks when you're trying to execute on it. Uh, the third thing is bad measurement, right? So if while you're trying to run the process, you're measuring the wrong things or not measuring anything, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be able to instrument and course correct on the fly. And then of course, magical deal thinking, right? Which is, you know, just optimism, right? So it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, we're pretty far behind, but yeah, there are these big deals coming and you guys have all heard it before, right? It's sort of, yeah, I, I know this one's going to close and I know it's not in the right stage or I know we haven't done any of the things that we're supposed to do and I, I know my opportunities aren't right, but, you know, I, I'll pull it out and I did it last quarter or, you know, all those other sources of magical thinking. So, so um, you know, how, how, do we how do we fix those, these problems? And, and now I'm going to try to get into uh, I think the nitty gritty of, of how we think this problem is, is best resolved, right? The first is um, you have to build to achieve, uh, you have to build to achievable sales plans, not your funding strategies, right? And that, I think that's probably the most common problem that we see. Obviously, there's, a, there's an element of sales planning that's top down. If you don't hit certain milestones, you cannot get funded in this environment. So, you know, there is pressure to go ahead and, and you know, reach certain stretch goals or hit certain targets. But you have to have a plan that is realistically built to achieve those goals. So it has to be both a, a top-down and a bottoms-up approach. Um, and so you really need to get the sales leadership involved in the go-to-market plan. Um, you, know, you can't pick arbitrary bookings goals. I know Saster's right across the street. so. My friends uh, from, from Bessemer are saying right now, oh, you need to have $10 million in your first week of sales or some other insane stat. And, you know, I mean, look, the, the demands keep getting higher and higher for, for companies. And, and there, it, it, kidding aside, we used to tell our, our portfolio companies, you need to get to a million dollar run rate to raise a Series A. Uh, and it seems like yesterday we said that. And now we say, you need to get to a $2 million run rate to raise a Series A. And I mean, that's a big number. And so I don't want to just shrug that off and, and pretend like that there's not real, real world pressure. But if the goal is higher, then you need to have the right, the right plan to, uh, to achieve that goal. Otherwise, you're engaging in, in fundamentally magical thinking. Um, and then uh, the second thing is, uh, the second mistake we see all the time is overestimating salespeople's ramp time. Um, I, mean, I think this really comes, I mean, it, it really comes from a notion of, you hit a certain milestone and then you say, well, we just need, you know, with two salespeople, we got to X. Therefore, if we double the number of salespeople, we can double X. And that is obviously false. It right? is demonstrably false, as all of you know. And, and so it just takes people time to ramp up, to learn the process, to develop the leads, and, and, and to be comfortable in, in selling. So, I mean, I, it, they, uh, we talked about this about overestimating ramp time by 2X. I think that's a pretty fair um, a fair number of, of the average overestimation is, is roughly double. Um, and you have to remember too, with early stage companies, um, not only are you ramping these salespeople, but the sales processes themselves are new. So the product is much more fluid and that's, so the collateral is being, first of all, the product is changing much more quickly. So it's harder to ramp, you know, it's harder to train someone on something that's changing every day, right? The second thing is the collateral is changing too. So, you know, it, oh, you know, is this the, do we have collateral for people in medical? No, no, we don't. Oh, yes, we do now. So, I mean, those things change in, in, in real time. So that's, uh, that's different. Um, you know, in a mature sales organization, you know who the, you know, ideal customer is because you've been selling for multiple years. In, in new companies, that's just not as clear. So, you know, you can't expect salespeople to ramp in the, uh, in the, same, in the same period of time. Uh, and then, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but in, in younger companies, there's no infrastructure. So, you know, you don't have a cohort of, like when six salespeople start together and they all get trained together, they can talk to one another and they can talk to the 
more senior people, and they get to talk to more junior people, and try to you know, get, you know, learn, well, mostly the senior people that learn, okay, well, what worked for you, and how'd you handle this before? When a company's young, and there's no one else to talk to. They talk to each other, I and mean, there are two people, two salespeople. So you can't really expect the, the ramp time to be, uh, to be the same as it would be in a big company. Um, making more territories is another key thing. And this is more about setting a stable foundation for growth. I mean, you could say we're overcomplicating. If you have four salespeople, why would you have 10 territories, right? But the problem becomes, well, the, reason, the answer to that question is because you're not going to have four for very long if the company's successful. You know, you're going to grow, and then what happens? So if, if you have uh, four salespeople, and, and let's just make it easy, uh, 12, you know, if you have four people in four sales territories, then when you hire the fifth person, then what happens? Well, you have to go into a meeting, and everyone decides, oh, we're going to take this part from this, and that part from this one, and, and they go, well, I, I'm, I've been working that account, so you can't take that, or you know, she has a good relationship with that customer, so we can't take that one. It's just a mess, right? And so you know you're going to subdivide these territories eventually. Just divide them at first. I mean, it's like uh, it's that old Yogi Berra joke. Uh, how does it go? Let's see if I get it right. Someone says, they go to Yogi Berra, um, uh, do you want your pizza cut in four pieces or 12? And he says, uh, you better cut it in 12. I'm, I'm really hungry, right? And so, I mean, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's just cut it up a little, bit, a little bit more clearly. And then hiring for sales churn. If I had to pick one thing, this is, I think, the number one mistake that young companies make. Salespeople churn. They churn in big organizations. And they churn not, you know, sometimes it's your fault, sometimes it's their fault, right? I mean, uh, you know, my, my sister just got a new job in Denver and I want to go there, or whatever it is. You know, people, people leave pretty frequently. And if you're a six-person sales organization and one person leaves, you lost a sixth of your capacity. And I'm, I'm awesome at math. That's why I'm so, such a great investor, right? So, um, <laughs> I mean, so I, this, I, I cannot tell you how often, how, how often I see this mistake made. Um, I mean, the best rule of thumb I ever heard is from uh, Mark Leslie, who was the uh, CEO of Veritas and just the most amazing salesperson I ever heard, the most amazing sales thinker. Um, he, he said, look, I've been doing this. He used to, I, I was lucky enough to, to be on a board where he was the, uh, uh, the chairman of that board. And he used to say, always hi he's like, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I still get it wrong 50% of the time. So he's like, just hire twice as many people as you need. And that was his rule of thumb. And, and it served him very well, and, and so I, I'll share it with you here. Um, and so, you know, when, you, when you're trying to fix the problem, focusing on you know sales ops execution is just is is a it's a great area. Of, I mean, some things are out of our control, and some things are in our control. And this is one area where you can actually fix a problem that's within your control, um, which is the sales ops execution, right? First of all, configuring the CRM for growth, right? And uh, Yusuf spoke so brilliantly about, about that. I'm not going to go into, into detail, but there are just a lot of known mistakes that folks make. And you know, if you can begin with the end in mind, you, know, you want to start thinking about building a system that is going to scale with your business. And if you, if you don't do that, you know, you're going to just slam into walls. Um, I guess on the most elemental, elemental level, You've got to get people using CRM right away, right? Because if you don't start, you know, if, it's, if you start with bad habits, you're just going to have more bad habits. And it's just going to be more painful to, I think it's, it's a lot harder to unlearn something. I actually went to a whole talk about unlearning things. And, uh, and it, it's just, it's difficult because you have this, you, your brain actually gets wired to do things in a certain way. So, you know, starting early to, to use CRM. And then not just use it, but to live by it, right? In other words, if you're not in the habit of like, using the CRM as your single source of truth, um, then uh, you know, it's not, it, it won't happen. And, and all sorts of bad things can, can come out of that. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I think measuring sales performance uh, it, is the is the other, is another really key way to fix these problems, and I, I want to. I guess I, I call this measuring sales performance, but it should be maybe measuring sales activity instead of sales performance. Because look, we all know like what do people focus on? It's like, did you make the number right? Did you hit the, hit the quarter right? There's there's one number that everyone knows, and the problem with that type of thinking is it's just 
it leads to eventual failure, right? I mean, you then if, if, if you're in a culture where everyone's oriented towards just that one number, just that one quarter number, right? You're, you're just setting yourself up for eventual disaster, right? So the way to get out of it is to build up a system where you're constantly reporting funnel activity and requirements. And, and I will say, from a board member's perspective, it's so much more helpful. Like, when someone comes in, like compare and contrast these two situations. Like the CEO walks in, or the VP of sales walks in, and she, she, she puts up the, the numbers that say, but well, we made the quarter, yay, right? Or, you know, and here, that's it, right? Versus here's where we are in the quarter, uh, here where the, the, here's where the pipeline is, and, and the best, CR, and, and uh, here are the activities, and sort of showing all of those things against quota. I mean, one of those things tells me you have a machine, a machine that's up and operating, and the other just says, hey, you know, you know, you rolled a lucky dice roll, and we just, we just don't know, right? Um, so reporting the funnel activity as a habit, uh, I think, is something that trains the entire organization to care about all of the things that will lead to long-term productivity and get you out of a situation where, um, you know, you're going to be scrambling. Well, I, you never get out of scrambling to make the end of the quarter, but it makes it less, less scrambling uh, at the end of the quarter. Um, <clears throat> And tracking, and the second point is tracking all of the results to plan, right? If you have a sales activity goal, that's got to get tracked, and that has to be, people have to be held to account for that in the same way that they are for the ultimate revenue number, right? And then uh, having full pipeline review. And that, you know, I think a lot of sales leaders uh, say, well, I just want to focus on the top three accounts. Let's just have that quick meeting and, and, you know, move on to the next thing. And that's just setting yourself up for eventual failure. Um, and then the, I think the hardest thing to stamp out is the magical sales thinking, right? Because it's so easy to convince yourselves. I mean, we all convince ourselves of different stories. And, and I think, um, <clears throat> so here are just a few suggestions of things that you can do. Um, you have to weight the pipeline evenly. Uh, I think there are lots of examples. We all, I don't think I have to go in with this group. But there are so many examples of, of when people do this the wrong way, and, and they... They tend to favor things. Look, you know, I know this person, and therefore, even though it's 50, it's really 75. And it's just super unproductive behavior, and eventually it's going to come back and bite you. Uh, don't elephant hunt. <clears throat> it turns out that mathematically, a really big number that's you know, weighted at 50% is still a pretty big number. Um, you know, that, that's pretty scary. Uh, and and well, the way I say it is, it, if you go out, and the only thing you're hunting for is elephants, if you don't kill an elephant, everyone starves in the village. So like, don't do that. You know, go shoot some deer and squirrels and small animals. <laughs> I mean, not really, but um, focus on opportunity creation. I mean, we talked about that a little bit, measuring it. But you know, if, if, if we don't think about and talk about opportunity creation at the rep level, at the manager level, at the CEO level, at the board level, if, if that's not what the conversation is about, then you can imagine what behavior is going to result. And that's not the type of behavior that leads to long-term um, stable and steady growth. And then, of course, cultivating a repetitive sales process, right? I mean, you, it, every now and again, these bluebirds come in, and people can pull out great sales deals. And that's amazing. And when it happens, that's great. You just don't want to build a, a, a business based on it. Uh, because eventually, it's, gonna, it's not going to happen one quarter. And, and you'd always like to have those bluebirds and those amazing uh, good luck stories be the upside surprise uh, and not the thing that gets the head of sales fired. So yeah, that, that, that's really all I've got. I'm going to, I'll just kind of summing, I think just kind of summing it up is nailing down that, that ideal customer profile, developing a repetitive sales process, um, having a predictable hiring process. I didn't really get into that, but a really a predictable scaling process, working on the CRM, and, and then uh, most importantly is reporting per performance and all of the performance indicators uh, all the way up the chain. And, and that's the thing I think that can make a big difference. So uh, that's all I've got. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions if there are any. I actually, so one thing you should know is from the investor point of view, things that are outside the ICP actually get discounted, right? Because from our point of view, I mean, you, you just have to think about where we sit. Like, 
We, we want to know, what we care about is how repeatable this is. And the only way we can test it is we look and say, are, like, are these customers clustered? Right? Because you know, if, it's like if you have some, you know, oh, we have this great customer in Dubai. It's like, well, I don't really expect that we're going to have a, you know, uh, a Dubai sales force in the near term. And, and, but I've seen, but I, I actually, Dubai is a real example that came from my head because I remember hearing it, right? And, and I'm like, look, I don't care about that. I mean, that, so I, I think you have to, you ha I mean, you don't want to shut the doors entirely. So if it's telling you, the real, I think the real question is why, right? If it's because, if you say, gee, maybe we got our ICP wrong and we really need to be chasing these types of companies, that's a different story. But if it's just like, hey, this is a one-off, but it's money, it's, I mean, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh, the answer is there are often sales ops teams. I mean, Series B is usually pretty small. So that's usually when the first sales ops person is getting hired. Um, so, and sometimes that person is really just a you know, shared resource with IT. I mean, Series B is usually still pretty small. Um, it kind of, it really kind of depends. So, I, I think, I, I think that's that's sort of where the because A is really we're using the tools, right? B once the once Series B gets done, I mean, Series Bs are pretty good sized rounds. Now we're going to start laying the foundation to go ahead. And it's